<laughs> so I'm going to introduce the, the panelists to you, and uh, I have a, a series of questions, three questions that I'd like to ask, one of them actually directly taking off from the presentation. But I wanted to bring to your attention the diversity of, of ages on our panel so that we will have at least three generations of people that you will hear from and their perspectives and their views. And I think uh, that, that is uh, really important as we think about reform versus transformation or reform and transformation because that's one of the issues that I want to get into. So to my very left, I would like to uh, introduce Reverend um, Sekou. And uh, Reverend Sekou um, is a religious leader who is an activist, and he's considered, according to the, to the information here, one of the foremost uh, leaders of his generation, not just for what he does religiously, but for his, his social political activism. And so uh, we will be hearing uh, from him as well. And I love this uh, char characterization here that Reverend Seko is a professor of preaching. I think I love that. I love that at the seminary consortium. Um, and to uh, his right is our student on our panel, our youngest member of our panel. And this is Felix Ruano. Felix is a senior here at um, RFK um, High School. And when we had our brief chat, he said he is a native of Los Angeles. Uh, and he is interested when he graduates in going on to become a journalist. And he asked me if I could introduce him to Tom Hayden. So <laughs> that is something that I will do before the, end of <laughs> before the end of this evening, Tom. Don't get away until that happens. One step at a time. Right. <laughs> and to my right is uh, Betsy McCormick, and she is co-chair of an organization called Reigniting Women, uh, which is a women's donors network. And what's in interesting about her work, and I'm sure she'll tell us more about it, has to do with the role of philanthropy and uh, uh, resource gathering, uh, in this case, uh, through, through women. And the fact that her, organ her cafe is one that is, I, I would say, sort of the model of interdependence, that it is local and global in terms of the gathering point or place for people in, um, uh, Colorado. So um, she's someone that, again, is bringing a different kind of perspective, and I think I think we'll be happy to hear from her. And to my right, you've heard uh, uh, from Paul uh, and heard about Paul earlier, but he's going to share more insights with us, particularly from the work he's doing now in his the organizations he's working with now, and uh, we'll also have uh, Tom. Uh, participating as well in in these questions. So what we want to have is a conversation among the five people. And uh, saying just a little bit more about me, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and my work is international and global. I, I study women in development around the world, and I uh, began my work with Ben Barber, and we I worked with him on the Civil World Project, which was a project to educate young people about what it means to be a global citizen. And so we started that work in New York, and I've continued that work uh, uh, with the Salzburg Global Seminar and also with the Mellon Foundation. So that's the work that I'm doing right now. Okay, so what I'd like to throw out is a question to everybody um, that has to do, kind of riffs on what um, Tom Hayden talks about, and that is how we realize social justice in a democracy when we've been at this um, not just 50 years, but a lot longer here, and in other places around the world, the same thing is happening. Um, how does this notion of independence impact, in this case, you can either go global or, or local or both, the kind of work that you're doing? How do you think of this issue of reform versus transformation and interdependence as you do your own work, and specifically around social justice or the social justice notions of the work that you do. And I think I'd like to start with Reverend Seiko. 
Uh, well, I would want to um, first just let me just say thank you to it's always an honor to be here. Uh, this is my fourth interdependence uh, day. Uh, I was deeply suspicious uh, at the first one. <laughs> Um, but I have come to look forward uh, to seeing many of my friends and colleagues from around the world. Um, and then it's you know always a pleasure to see my dear uh, friend, uh, Brother Barbara, and his lovely wife. Um, and, 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 and I, I want to begin by answering your question. Uh, I, I, Dr. Moses, I bring you greetings from Faye Harrison, ah. my uh, beloved mentor and her beloved mentor, St. Clair Drake, and his notion of the para-intellectual. Right. So I want to begin our understanding of social justice and the arts from the images and the ideas by giving an epistemic privilege to the people who don't matter. Right. So I want, I want to begin with them. Right. So here we're in Los Angeles and we have Los Angeles has produced some of the greatest philosophers of our time, particularly N.W.A. <laughs> Niggas with Attitude in their <laughs> critical song of 1991 called Fuck the Police. While law officials were offended by the song, what was happening inside of the, the, the guttural discourse that was present and part and parcel of an African-American vernacular society, that, a discourse that goes back as far as Lead Belly in 1933, what they were articulating was a way in which black men encountered the police department one year before the Rodney King riots. So if we would have listened to them, perhaps we could have prevented the riots. Same thing in London. I covered the London riots for Vibe magazine. Three, uh, 28 days before Mark Duggan was shot down like a dog by the British police, a group of hip hop artists assembled a gathering called Who Polices the Police? Ah, interesting. No one spent any time with them. But if we're willing inside a democracy to give an epistemic privilege to those who sit outside the democracy and Western societies as aliens inside of those societies, then perhaps we can get a greater access to what democracy looks like from their eyes. I, in my current uh, incarnation, I am the editor-in-chief of Spirit Change News. We brought you some copies. Cornell's on the cover. And our paper's run by homeless men and women. Right? So what does it mean for the fourth estate to be grounded in the vision of people who literally sleep outside the democracy? Right? And so for me, my understanding, uh, the best way to come to understand the role of art, um, uh, the role of justice within our society, and I would want to caveat so and, uh, social justice and interdependence as part of the ontology of a democracy. So not just things that we think about outside, it's not just what's happening uh, 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 in, in this conference, but we assume that they are a part of the givenness of what it means to de of, of a democracy. And that givenness begins with measuring the success of society against the realities and understandings of the world who are the most vulnerable, which brings me back to NWA, who are para-intellectuals. They are people who consume knowledge and bring uh, social critique in such a way that they offer a different set of insights as outsiders. Thank you. Now. <clears throat> Now, I wanted to, um, I, I uh, <laughs> told uh, uh, Felix that I wasn't going to put him on the spot. Uh, so I'm going to come to him third, right? I'm going to have a couple <laughs> people talk, and then we'll go to Felix, because we want to hear Felix's perspective. So, um, so Betsy, Betsy McKinney will, will answer the question, I, if you'd like, Betsy. Well, I think if I understood the question, it's how does um, interdependence, you know, what is the relevance and how does interdependence affect the work that we're doing? Um, and so my work right now with the Women Donors Network is um, initiative, an initiative called Reigniting Women. And um, it's an exploration of how, um, how will we craft a message and how will we engage women in a broad way, really in an unprecedented fashion to get women to be more active in participating in democracy and advocating for the issues that that are meaningful to them. And so what will that take? And interdependence as a concept really is very relevant to women because the partnership between men and women is really a fundamental issue of interdependence. 
that men and women, um, we are interdependent in how we're represented on Earth. We're 50% men, 50% women, give or take a percentage of po uh, point or two. We're interdependent in creating life. It's the essence of one man, the essence of one woman that creates human life and that really in making the decisions about our democracy, about our future, uh, for, the, for future generations, um, really is about how men and women will share power in order to make the decisions about our future and for our children. So uh, interdependence for women is there a narrative that includes interdependence that actually gives women uh, the ability to see how they can participate, whereas we've had the vote for less than 100 years, and there has mm. been no real collective statement by women or a, mm. a strong historical statement made by women that says um, this, is what, this is where we see the future, this is what we want for ourselves. Um, and what is that question mm. now that we need to answer as women as we watch really society unraveling, democracy, uh, you know, imperiled, not just here in the United States, but globally. And so how do we build a movement now and reach out to women in such a way that interdependence can inspire them and to bring us to collective action in a way that's really needed? Because I think we all know women's voices, as has been said earlier, you know, we can bring peace and bring um, uh, a calming and, um, partnership perspective with men that takes our differences as men and women, our different strengths, and uses them in complementary ways in order to forge a future that's interdependent. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> Felix, from your perspective, from where you sit as a 17-year-old, what do you think about this? notion of interdependence and um, uh, and what do you think about this notion of social justice in our in our lives locally but also in California as well as as globally okay. well first of all let me start by saying that it's humbling experience just being on stage with these minds <laughs> and it's interesting how we can bring this social justice topic across all boundaries, and we talk about the economic boundaries, mm -hmm. gender boundaries, and now the youth boundary across age differences. So from my experience as editor-in-chief of my high school newspaper, <laughs> I I've, I've don't get any closer to the idea of interdependence than by having students who are affected by issues of today write about the issues of today I think that's it doesn't get any more powerful than that. So what I've like to bring to the newsroom in high school is this idea that you can be as be, be an agent of change even if you're just under the voting age. And I think that's powerful. Um and I'd also like to echo the sentiment of of being powerful with with the words you say and the people you meet, and um, I think it should be noted that ideally this this room should be full of of students who who should have been able to listen to these these people who who in another time were the greatest agents of change. So I think it's almost a shame that all my classmates couldn't be here right now to listen to these people. So that's right. Thank you. So Paul, uh, you know this has been um, a long journey for yourself, and I'm sure you have some things to, to some words of wisdom to share with us about that journey. And uh, what do you see interdependence bringing to our notions of social justice and vice versa? How is social justice um, woven into the warp and woof, as Dr. Seiko says, of our understanding of interdependence and, de and democracy. Well, social, <coughs> fighting for social justice is a question of interdependence because you can't build a social justice curriculum or movement without people being interdependent. Uh, <clears throat> it was good to see Tom Hayden in this prof professorial role today 
uh, particularly when I've known him since Port Huron days when he was using a UAW facility in Michigan uh, to get the, uh, uh, his statement out there. And I was with him in Chicago. Uh, I was inside the convention hall uh, and, uh, and he was out in the streets uh, carrying on a struggle for justice there. And we were trying to do the same thing inside, trying to get a peace plane. Uh, <clears throat> what Tom was saying was sort of my life went by me very quickly uh, because uh, I was raised with a very, fairly poor family in Saratoga Springs, New York, uh, into uh, truck farming and florist business and so forth, and which didn't do too well during the Depression. And I was wound up at Yale University uh, for my junior year with a scholarship, three jobs, and a long-term loan. And I was a chemistry major. And all of a sudden, I began to say, I, uh, I, I met Harold, uh, Harold, Harold. Uh, Dickey? No, not Harold Dickey. <laughs> uh, the, the socialist professor from uh, England. Uh, Lasky. Harold Lasky, yeah. Lasky. Who also, by the way, educated the Kennedy brothers uh, because Joe Kennedy wanted them to have this sort of. So I wound up saying, why am I spending my time in the laboratory uh, when all these political things are going on. And I was working on a book on philosophy with filmer S.C. Northrup on the meeting of East and West uh, as one of my jobs. And so at the end of the year, my brother and I got into some difficulties with my father and we said, we're gonna take off for California. And I decided to wait another year to go back to school, wound up uh, working at North American Aviation getting interested in, in, in unions. Uh, we were only 40% organized at that point. I became a committeeman. Three years later, I was president of local, uh, uh, leading a strike in 1953 called the Yale Youngster Strike of 16,000 workers. Uh, and ostensibly, we lost the strike, but we fought for a principle of equal pay for aerospace workers who were getting 25 cents an hour less fewer benefits than auto workers working in the automobile industry in the same union. Well, we won that issue uh, a year later after a change uh, of, of uh, international uh, uh, officers uh, for us. Um, so then I wound up in the civil rights movement, uh, the women's rights movement. We had some difficulties uh, that way, I wound up in the peace movement. I was 30 years on the board of the ACLU working on workers' rights questions. And all of a sudden, you know, what Tom was making would make sense with my life because I'm movement oriented. Uh, the move, uh, peace movement led me to uh, uh, speaking against the war in 1966 at the Keystar Stadium with uh, Coretta King wound up in uh, San Francisco in 1971, uh, chairing the, the hundreds of thousands of uh, people in the peace movement, marching into the polo grounds, uh, and on, on stage with Carl Reiner as a co-chair with Carl Reiner and uh, Dalton Trumbo, one of the Hollywood 10. Uh, Wayne Morris was there. We did a, uh, a number of things uh, to really get the peace movement going. And fortunately, that night, uh, I wound up at a party and met Monica Weil. And uh, we found out that we had things in common, like uh, 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 different foods and so forth. And we wound up to become good friends and finally got married in 73. <laughs> so movements do produce wonderful <laughs> results. <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, let me get back to social justice because Part of working in the United Auto Workers Union, just unions are usually a question of social justice. And with the Ruther brothers, uh, we were making great headway. We actually built a middle class uh, mm -hmm. in, in America because the corporations would not go to us, with, with us to Congress on questions of health care, question of retirement, and all the other issues. So we had to build it into our wages, taking less wages and building pension programs and, and Insurance, health insurance programs and so forth. So we did that in the UAW. Uh, we also were able uh, here in, in, in Los Angeles to go to Watts during the 60s, build the Watts Labor Community Action Committee, 
a, where people themselves were, were working on these projects. We came in as a sort of a sponsor and, and not as a participant so that people in Watts who understood more about questions of poverty and discrimination than we did and knew more about the answers. And that organization is still alive mm -hmm. and well as one of the few organizations that survived the defeat of the war on poverty because of the war in Vietnam. Uh, <coughs> We also worked that way in, with, with the farm workers in Delano. And then we get back to Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy was the only person, I worked with him in the 1960 convention. We had s some difficult problems in that convention and I was able to work with him to solve those problems. So there was a real bonding back in 60. Uh, we went through a period with his brother was the uh, president of the United States. And I, that was, a, a really important turning point for all of us. And it leads to the question of interdependence because the Kennedy brothers in solving the Cuban Missile Crisis began to build the kind of interdependence idea uh, that, that President Kennedy had about the world. Uh, he actually had to take on the Joint Chiefs of Staff and you, you, the, this is all in the White House uh, recordings uh, of, of the, of the uh, XCOM uh, group that was meeting on the Cuban Missile Crisis. He fought for the idea that we had to work with the Soviet Union in order to solve that. When the military wanted to bomb Cuba, even one general, General LeMay, wanted to bomb the Soviet Union, get it over with, and, yet, and President Kennedy said, yeah, get it over with. Who do you think we are? So there was this kind of contention going on uh, within that, or what people generally don't know, and one of the things that we're going to do, be doing here at this school, because the students have gone into the history of the Ambassador Hotel uh, called Now and Then, uh, and, and really built a wonderful performance in video and stage production, which is shown here in the theater to other students. We want to do the same thing with Robert Kennedy because during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he played a, probably the most important role in going to Dobrynin uh, at the Department of Justice building and getting a commitment uh, to, to do something about ending the Cuban Missile Crisis. What people don't generally know is after the Cuban Missile Crisis, this whole question of interdependence with the Soviet Union and with, with Cuba and Castro continued on over the objections of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the objections of the CIA. Kennedy was actually doing secret negotiations with Khrushchev uh, to, to end, uh, end the, uh, the, not only the uh, 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 nuclear testing in air and, and water, but in all kinds of other aspects of it. He also sent uh, two representatives to uh, Cuba to, to explain to Castro that a relationship had to be put together. On the internet yesterday, you know, the Kennedys wanted to kill Castro. You know, it's still part of our whole idea of, of, of what this world is all about. So the interdependence question we saw really beginning with President Kennedy and, and Robert Kennedy building a relationship with, with uh, Khrushchev. Uh, we don't, we, I never knew until I read a Norman Cousins book that he was a go-between between, between Pope John, Khrushchev, and Kennedy in order to continue this kind of interdependence that became a, more of a focus of, of the Kennedy administration. That carried on. I think you know, uh, 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 Nixon can take a great deal of, of credit for opening up uh, interdependence with, with China. Uh, Reagan with 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 Gorbachev, and so in 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 in, in the school we want to not only get into the question of social justice as we're building a neighborhood organization dealing with uh, neighborhood problems, but also in this whole question of independence among nations because it's it's so important to our survival. Thank you, Paul. Uh, <clears throat> Tom, do you have anything you want to add about? Uh, perhaps the work that you're doing right now or to whatever the, what the panel has said so far? Just uh, I want to tell Felix that I'm looking forward to meeting him. 
when, when you set that up. Uh, <laughs> and that you shouldn't blame the student body for not being here. It's not a good organizing approach. Uh, <laughs> they have their reasons and we'll have to find out what they are. Uh, I, do, I do think what Paul said at the, at the end uh, needs to be repeated and taught and spread because the struggle for memory is uh, supremely important and there's a lot of contention about what if Kennedy had lived, what if Bobby had lived. Uh, I was very mixed up in that period and had met both of them uh, and uh, my view could be wrong but what I really, I really object to are people trying to reduce the Kennedys to um, caricatures who got involved in scandals or Noam Chomsky saying that if John Kennedy had lived he would have still carried out the war in Vietnam with 500,000 troops. It's complete nonsense. It's not based on facts. Um, I, I think um, what, what Paul just said uh, really um, is a way of visualizing uh, interdependence in the way that we saw it during those days, which was could we achieve peaceful coexistence mm -hmm. between r rival systems uh, yeah. and, and let that competition play out politically or economically or culturally, but keep it within mm -hmm. the bounds of diplomacy and negotiation uh, and not violence. Uh, and, and last, I think uh, in general, the women's movement have always been uh, uh, deeply uh, invested in this notion. That's one of the reasons, until recently, women were not considered qualified to be president mm -hmm. because they, would, they just wouldn't kill people with that uh, quickness or decisiveness that's required of uh, the man in the Oval Office. And, and in fact, for a woman to become president, she might have to prove that she's a man. It's, it's still there, but um, interdependence uh, or coexistence, I think, is the most uh, important uh, discipline to teach, and probably also you could, you could connect it to the, the art of conflict resolution mm -hmm. with respect to gang violence and racial troubles. These are not taught very much, but they're actually skills. Mm -hmm. They're actually uh, philosophically grounded, uh, and they, they can be taught and exercised. Okay, thank you mm. very much. Um, <clears throat> what do we have in time? Okay. How much? Five to 10, okay, Qu quickly. Yes, other panel. <laughs> Quick, quickly, I would like to have folks here sort of say one or two, give one or two things if we, we were going to say to Ben. Ben, we've done 10 years of, of really good work building the movement. What is it you would tell him that needs to happen to, to continue to sustain this work? Where does the heavy lifting still need to be? And how can um, he? How can this movement help to uh, sustain itself uh, over the next ten years? So I think I would like to start with you, Betsy. Well, that's a big question, yeah. Yolanda. But you don't have to think too much um, about it. Just no, I won't. Roll that out. So <laughs> I think it. I, well, from a woman's perspective, I think it's about enlisting women in the concept of interdependence. Because when women look back historically, while we've had our moments, and uh, you know whether it's getting suffrage in the 20s or the equal rights um, movement in the 70s. Really, when we look at the power structure in this country and in the world, it doesn't represent us, and it doesn't tell our story. It's a story of history. And how might we engage women with this concept of interdependence so that we can transform history into our story? And when you do that with women, women obviously represent um, all other divisions you know that we have for humans you know we're white we're black we're um, jewish we're catholic we're muslim so i think engaging women is critical and um and i think also that you know women and 
their ability to empower themselves is the story. And it's about women learning how to step into power and into partnership as opposed to expecting it. It's not, it's not something that has to be given. Women every day already are in their small acts in their homes, in their kitchen, you know, in their schools, in our communities. Women are stepping up into partnership and, um, and creating a movement that is more reflective of women, I think, is critical and will um, really benefit the interdependence movement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Reverend Seiko, what still needs to be done? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm, uh, the, the two things are uh, running uh, through my head. One, I'm just thinking about that we have had a head of s someone to run for the president of their country who was part of this group, right? Brother uh, 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 Aluru from Uganda, uh, and I hear and Brother Harry, a potential candidacy of the president of Nepal, right? That's, that's serious when you have heads of s people who are inspired by this work to the point that they seek power in their governments as the head of state. I think that's something to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. So I, so I want to hold that, because I want to hold that in the context of the, that part of the independence discourse so that it does not get reduced to uh, politically correct chit chat among bourgeois intellectuals, present company notwithstanding. <laughs> but to say that, 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 so then there must be some ideology attached, right? That, that there is some, that, that I think part of what has to be done is a general conversation about what do we believe about the role of government in its relationships to its citizens and the role of government in its relationships to the citizens of other nations, which might include control of public resources. Right, might include living wages for everyone. Might include a fundamental emphasis on the role of art inside, uh, uh, inside the construction of governmental apparatus, right? Right, to begin to have real thought out ideological converse conversations and then to own, at least my understanding and why I'm here, I could be uh, wrong, is that to own, uh, in, 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 to own a left of center project, like to be honest, about that conversation <laughs> openly and outwardly in a real way. Not a neoliberal one, but a left of center one. And if it is a neoliberal tension and a left of center, t a left's tension, to be open about that conversation in the cold, uh, because I think that's what's at stake. Next year, we could be having this conversation under a Romney administration. Oh, right, so what does that mean? Right? The word. right, so the word interdependence in the context of having this conversation under a Romney administration, the word uh, uh, interdependence in itself could be considered a terrorist threat. Right, that's the moment that we're in, what Brother Jakob calls a creeping totalitarian individualism which is present in both political parties, latent in one, manifest in the other. Right, so how, like, so for me, that is the kind of conversation that we need to be having at the ideological and constructive uh, level. And then, lastly, this is what we have always done, and, and uh, is and, uh, in our gatherings together, is to place an emphasis on joy. Mm. Yes. Right, yes. We can, because at the end of the day, right, joy, that non material, non commodified force, in such a way that even if Romney's in power, my grandmother used to sing a song, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. And so it's having joy in the midst of all of this as a way to get, bring levity and a sense of peace and a sense of understanding that we can hold at bay the demons of depression and despair so that we all can be long distance runners like Brother Paul and Brother Tom. All right, thank you. I, <clears throat> I'm going to give Felix the last word, so I would like to ask my colleagues here to um, say what they think still needs to be done quickly. Well, I, I think uh, since Clinton, um, every time I go to Washington, all the youngsters on the Hill, they start at 20 and they stay and stay. They've all been indoctrinated as liberals into neoliberalism, which means the market philosophy. It's not like before 1990 when you had more um, left progressive staffers kind of running things. Now they look at you puzzled if you favor uh, the public control of anything. 
like an insurance company or healthcare. It's like some idea from another planet. And this is one reason the Republicans are so effective in Washington is that there's no internal opposition from a different mm -hmm. standpoint. So mm -hmm. teaching the next generation some alternative to neoliberalism, uh, teaching them to look at Latin America uh, uh, is, is crucial because consciousness does, uh, does matter. Um, I think also fighting uh, in the streets, the ballot box, and the courtroom against uh, the uh, private uh, money dominating politics is an issue that's really ready to, ready to roll, especially if Romney wins, you are gonna see uh, that battle unfold. For youngsters of uh, Felix's generation, I have this to say, just to, that we thought we had it bad. Paul's talking about, we, we lived through what we thought was the beginning of nuclear war and legalized racism. That's what we were facing, mm. pretty hopeless. But not as bad as living without any possibility of a job and, mm. and looking forward to the end of the world which is what your generation is faced with. Because of the climate change. Climate change. Yeah, yeah. Climate change is some kind of euphemism. Uh, it means the end of the world. It means like as we know it. And so it's hard to grow up without a job and facing planetary collapse. And all I have to say is um, I think the human, human beings are adaptable, okay. that they have capacity to remember, to learn, to create. And even this seemingly insurmountable set of problems you face will be confronted because it has to be because we continue to be human. You will not settle for it. And I'm looking forward to your advancement. Um, Tom, can I just add one point to that? Because Felix, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by that. <laughs> um, um, I also want to say that you know, what you have also to look forward to in your generation is that you have more elders now who have gone through this for the past 40, 40 or 50 years. There's a more developed environmental... 40 or 50, speak for yes, yourself. Yes, 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 mm. yes, sorry. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> I, I, was, I was starting to say the environmental movement okay. and then preceding that, you know, it goes back <laughs> hundreds, you know, centuries really, and that there's a progression and an evolution of this movement that has a rich history and a lot of, I would like to say, wise people out there all over who are older and ready and standing here side by side with you and Very your good. generation. Well said. Huh. Yes. <laughs> As part of the Robert Kennedy legacy and the legacy of many others, uh, <clears throat> we are beginning to build neighborhood organization here. Mm. Uh, and we were working with a group uh, based out of the Wils Wilshire Center. The commercial people around this area didn't want this school here, mm. but now they accept it, they love it, and we're working together. And we're working with all kinds of neighborhood organizations all, all, already. There's one piece of unfinished business that I don't talk about very much because we haven't gone public with it, but part of Robert Kennedy's legacy was to find out who killed President, uh, who killed President, John, uh, President Kennedy. Uh, he said in, uh, on March 25th, 1968, opening up his campaign, he was speaking out at uh, what is now Cal State Northridge. Uh, after he spoke, he opened it to questions. And the chanting was, uh, open the archives, open the archives. And somebody cont continuing uh, pelted him with the question, who killed President Kennedy? And he stuttered around for a while and he said, I've not answered this question before, but nobody's more interested in who killed President Kennedy than I am. I, will op I know what's in the archives and they will be released at the appropriate time. Now those archives were partially opened. They were supposed to be fully opened next year at the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy. They are not going to be opened. Now, one of the things that Robert Kennedy said during that campaign, and it's, it's heart-rending, was uh, he kept saying, uh, I must become president of the United States in order to get by 
the CIA, get by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, get by the military, and, and be in the White House to find out who killed President Kennedy. To me, that's part of his legacy. For a long time, I worked with Allard, as a result of Allard Lowenstein, getting me involved in who killed Robert Kennedy back in 1974. Uh, we continued up until 1992, and we failed to really get the law enforcement establishment in California and Los Angeles to do anything about it. Recently, an audio tape was found in the, in the FBI uh, files, now in the California State Archives, which proved what we knew right from the beginning, that there was a second gunman in the pantry that night. That audio tape proves beyond a shadow of a doubt now that there were 13 shots fired based upon uh, a very high-tech uh, uh, study of that audio tape. It also shows the make and the model of the second gun. Hmm. And uh, there is a person of interest in this thing. And we uh, have established a, a, a case that's now before the US Attorney General. Uh, we haven't gone public with it yet. We know now that the second gunman actually fired the fatal shot in Robert Kennedy. It was not Sirhan. We know Sirhan shot me and four other people that night, but he did not fire the fatal shot into Robert Kennedy. So we're on the verge of, try, of trying to reopen that case. I say this because Robert Kennedy was trying to find out the same thing about who killed President Kennedy. And I think I'm honor bound to find out who killed Robert Kennedy. One of us, last words before Ethel got to him when he said, Ethel, oh Ethel, as he was dying. Before that, somebody heard him say, uh, is everybody okay? Is Paul all right? And to me, that's a haunting memory of mm. that night. And it has meant to me not only to work, to have this school built in his, uh, to, to continue his legacy, but also to do the hard work of finding out who killed both of the Kennedys, because that should be on our agenda. Let me just say one more thing. The, the books that I've been reading lately that show more about the history of the Kennedys than anything else are one called Brothers by David Talbot, and the other one, uh, JFK, The Unspeakable, by uh, James Douglas. We're working on two uh, documentaries on those two books now. The book I recently discovered was Norman Cousins, who I found out was the go-between between, between uh, Pope John, Khrushchev, and Kennedy in order to establish more of a sense of interdependence, at least between the Soviet Union, Cuba, and the United States. So my life continues to go forward. At 87, thank God Monica's with me I, <laughs> and, and keeps me some sort of on the straight and narrow about working on these projects, but that's my life. And that's the way I continue to, to live it. Thank you. I got to talk to you about that case. After hearing um, Tom and and Paul talk, my initial reaction is always, "Man, I was I was born in the wrong era." <laughs> <laughs> but then thinking back to what interdependence stands for, um, I think it really means to think beyond yourself and your own, your own life, your own school, and your own neighborhood. Think beyond that. And I think, and this echoing what you said, the heart of the matter is that, and the reality is that you guys will not be here forever. And then it should be thought of more of as a relay where you guys hand the tor torch over to my generation. Yeah. <laughs> And going on that topic, I think we should scratch the question that you gave us, where you, you asked, what do you think the interdependence movement can, can do to improve the life of my generation? Yes. I think it should be flipped, and this is going on what JFK once said, that we should be asking what, what my generation could do for the interdependence movement. All right.